So turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. We're going to start with prayer, but you can get your Bibles there first. Romans chapter 5. You should have that sheet as you walked in as well to be able to participate and come up with great answers to the questions for the study. So Carol Sue is already game on for that, so I will be looking this way the whole time. So, right, so yeah. All right, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you always humbly, recognizing that we are sinners in need of a Savior. You are that Savior, and you have saved us from sin, death, and the devil. Lord, as we continue to go on this journey through life, this adventure, be with us always. Comfort us with your presence, and grant us strength in your word. Bless our study of your word, that it may be fruitful, and that you would embolden us to share what we have been given to share, the love and forgiveness of Christ our Savior and Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, so I told you last week that we're entering into my favorite part of Romans, Romans 5 through 8. So this week and next uh, is just uh, my favorite portion of the book. Um, that being said, um, we've navigated quite a bit here on this journey in terms of Jew and Gentile relationship and the challenges of trying to speak to two different groups of people uh, for Paul. And now we enter into a phase that brings us into uh, not only what it says, the peace with God, but also the great peace that comes in our baptism. And so as Lutherans, we always highlight baptism. It is where we receive the Holy Spirit. It's where we receive the gift of faith. It is the best day of your life, and every day thereafter becomes the best day of your life because you are baptized. And so, again, Romans chapter 5, 1 through 11 is where we're going to start. I'm going to read those theme verses again and that definition of an adventure just to keep that before you. So, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, but it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And the definition of an adventure, an unusual and exciting, typically hazardous experience or activity. Romans 5, 1 through 11. Therefore, all right, got to stop already. My pastor growing up always said, when you see the word therefore, you have to stop and ask yourself, what is the therefore, therefore? Ha, ha, ha. That's a pastor joke if ever there was one. <laughs> but, Gail, Gail. That is my genuine laugh. I've been working on that just for you. So anyway, I digress to the word therefore. And the therefore is in buildup, a basis of the first four chapters. One who's reading chapter five needs to slow down, back the truck up, and read chapters one through four. Now we have done this already, so we're going to keep going here. But whenever you see that word, therefore, that's what you want to do. Or if you start to see the words, these things, in its explanation, what are the these things are talking It typically means something that happened before this in the text preceding. So you want to make sure to back up. So, therefore, all right, end of study. We got through one word. Well done. All right. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice, hmm, sounds like a sermon today, in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. 
the next verse here is Pastor May's favorite verse in all of Scripture. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. <coughs> All right. A lot of key words in this text that we could spend a lot of time unpacking. We don't have a lot of time, but we're going to spend some time looking at a couple of these words. And that first word is justification. All right? It's not a word that we use with regularity. <coughs> But what does the word justification mean? When you hear that you are justified, what does that mean? Made right. Made right. But specifically, what's the relationship here? You have been made right how? Through Christ. Through Christ. And the relationship here is God and you. All right? And so you, as a sinner, are not right. I'll that for a blow. All right? You are not right because of your sinfulness, and God, through Jesus Christ, then gives you and makes you justified, justification before God. So consider it as a court scene here. And you are the one who is the defendant. You are standing there, and the judge is about ready to deliver their verdict. And then all of a sudden, as the judge is about ready to say guilty and slam that gavel down, Jesus stands in and says, nope, I will take every one of his counts of guilt upon myself, and I will take every one of the punishments, this would be the death penalty, from this individual now that person, you, may go free as innocent and clean as can be. Because there is one who has stepped into your place. We call that vicarious atonement. Vicarious atonement simply means there is one who has substituted himself in your place for forgiveness. Barry, what's up? In the King James, it uses the word atonement. There you go, there you go. Which immediately, when we get that language, we immediately, and this is really helpful, because it connects us to the Old Testament. We're actually going to talk about this in the Sermon for Reformation Sunday, actually, and the nature of the Day of Atonement, because what would happen on the Day of Atonement? The priest would enter into the Holy of Holies in order to make atonement, satisfaction for the sins of the people. This is why I love the way that our church is designed. Because our church is specifically designed as if it is in mirror to the tabernacle and the temple. You are seated in what's called the nave. All right? The nave is where the people sit. So you think of a ship that's upside down. Oh, wait, it's got a point. It's like an upside down boat. Exactly. You are seated in this area. This is where the people would enter into the temple. Then, as you go further in, you get to the chancel, and this is the area that the word of God and the forgiveness of sins are proclaimed to the people. It's the middle ground here, but then, as you enter, see, we call this whole building the sanctuary. That's not true. This is actually the sanctuary. The sanctuary is the area that is located beyond the rail where the altar and the sacrifice would have been made. So, when you see this, you're also connecting your mind to the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant, where the priests were only entering one time a year into the Holy of Holies to make satisfaction for the people. This is why we teach our acolytes right from the start. When you come here, you always do what? Bow in reverential respect for the fact that you are entering into the Holy of Holies of God. So atonement is a great word for it there. Justification comes in two different forms. 
All right? The two different forms are general justification and subjective justification. All right? What does that mean? That means that when Jesus dies on the cross, he dies for the sins of all people. This is the general justification. All people are given this justification before God. So then, why aren't all people saved? Say what? Say it. Say it. They don't have faith. They don't have faith. They reject the general justification. We would also call this, to connect to what Barry said, the universal atonement. So the fact that all people are given the gift. All people. But there are those that would reject, and so this then becomes the subjective justification is, is that if you reject, well, then you don't receive the gift, all right? So this is Christmas, right? Grandma gives you the sweater. It is not a good-looking sweater. And what do you do? You take it back because you reject the gift, all right? See how well that goes next time Grandma asks you to wear the sweater is. So, point being is, if we reject the gift, then I don't receive the justification. So... Moving on, another word to focus in on. He uses the word peace. When you hear the word peace, what comes to mind? The 60s, right? All right. <laughs> peace, love, all that goes with it. I was born in 1981, so I don't know anything of what you're talking about. All right? But that's not what we're talking about, this peace, love, hippie stuff that we're talking about here in Nome. All right? We're also not talking about an absence of what? Of war or conflict or, I'm looking for another word, hate, hate or, uh, well, love, yeah, uh, suffering. All right? The peace that we see often in our flesh is an absence of suffering. Where are we told that the absence of suffering is going to exist for us? Heaven. There will be no suffering in heaven. While we live in this world, though, we will endure, endure suffering. What does Jesus say? In this world, you will have tribulation. tribulation. You will have trouble. Exactly. Who's, who's to blame? No. Well, yes. The devil. My namesake. All right? The, the one to blame is Adam, though I always blame Eve and stuff. Just like, <coughs> just works better for me, and that's what Adam did in Genesis. So, the woman who you gave to be with me, she's the one who made me eat of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, Adam. Yeah, way to go. That argument didn't hold up really well. But, point being is here, peace is not just simply an absence of suffering. And if we're looking for an absence of suffering here on this earth, we're always going to come up short. Because we're going, we're going to suffer. Um, it's just a reality. And, and, and the reality is, too, is we keep sinning. Okay? So, we're going to get into that. Yeah, actually in 512 and 21, on uh, original sin, we talk about that a little bit more as well. The peace that we have, the peace that we have is what? Between what? God and us. Yes, exactly. Now you are not at enmity, at enmity with God. Okay? So we need to view it as, as sinners, we stood in direct opposition to the Almighty God. We stood as enemies. So this is David and Goliath, where God is David, and you're Goliath and everything, and you are at absolute opposition. You're going to lose, all right? But the thing is, is that God, like you said, sends Christ in order to deliver that peace. And that's why, as we say at, uh, which connects to Philippians chapter 4, which is actually our epistle reading for today, the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding. We can't grasp it. Alright? This is third article language here. The third article says, not by our own reason or strength. Alright? I can't comprehend this peace. Alright? It's beyond my knowledge because, well, he's creator and I'm created. Alright? There's always going to be a struggle there with that. Okay? So, how does this True peace get delivered to us. Barry hit that. And in what ways does it alter the way we navigate the adventures of this world of sin and suffering? 
If you have the peace of God, how does that alter the way you navigate this world? So we now, we approach the Lord as if, and, and I love that imagery actually, so that's the meaning there in the introduction to the Lord's Prayer. And so we come to the Lord in confidence, all right? So if any of you have kids, all right, grandkids, whatever it might be, all right, I mean, and you've ever had a kid come up and sit on your lap, all right, and that kid comes up and sits on your lap, all right, that's the relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father. We can approach God in confidence knowing that He will not condemn us. All right? But it also means that we can approach our neighbor in confidence as well. Because we don't have to fear condemnation from God. Hey, I might get this conversation completely wrong. This is something that I continually remind myself in pastoral care. <laughs> because the reality is, is that I'm still a sinner working with the word of the Lord. And I have to come to terms with the fact of, I can't save this person. Only God can do that. But as I engage with this person, I trust the word of the Lord to do its work in the midst of that person's life. But at the same time, I need to remind myself, my salvation is not contingent upon the success of this conversation. So if this person doesn't convert at this very moment... If this person doesn't just simply say, yup, I believe whatever you say, right, then that's okay. It's okay. Our role is to plant the seed and the spirit does the work. All right? So we're a farming community. This works really well in terms of God talk because plant the seed and what happens? The watering, the feeding of that seed is all done by God in his word. <coughs> Is God's love dependent upon our actions? No. So does God say, well, you haven't gotten done good enough and everything, so no love for you? No. God's love, and we'll hear about this in Romans 8 next week. Well, we probably won't. It's at the end of Romans 8. We know we never get through the whole study. So, <laughs> but nothing separates you from God's love. Gail, I see you making comments over there. Stuff, so Carol Sue and everything. So does any they give behavior tickets at school? So everything. So <laughs> uh, yeah, it's not dependent. So why is our understanding of this truth so vital to our faith? That God's love isn't dependent upon our actions. Why is that so vital to our faith? By the grace of you saved. Okay, so it's all God's action. And what what is it set up if all of a sudden it would be dependent upon my actions. What if God's love was dependent upon my actions? <laughs> you wouldn't get any. You ain't got no love. Yeah, that's going to be my next song that I write. You ain't got no love. Yeah, but your your love isn't his love isn't dependent on our actions, but your salvation is dependent upon your repentance. You still nope. need to repent to get to heaven. God loves everybody, but not everybody's going to heaven. Well, so then you wonder, did you really repent good enough? You know, what, what happens if during confession, your mind starts thinking about something else? No, oh, yeah, no, i got to repent. Then you always wonder, did you repent? Yeah, but, but, good question, but the reality is, is that my repentance doesn't flow from myself. My repentance flows from a love of God that is given to me. It's a natural outpouring, then, of faith that I simply repent because God has told me to do so. But just because I repent, or if I don't repent, does not negate the love of God. It does not negate the love of God whatsoever. If God's word is true, and we would hold that God's word is true, and nothing separates me from his love, then even if I don't repent, God still loves me. However, who's the one doing the rejecting? It's the person who says, I won't listen to what you're saying. I'm going to close this door to God. <coughs> That's like every action is a reaction. Yeah. So, all right. So <laughs> Romans 5, 12 to 21. 5, 12 to 21. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, thank you, Adam, 
And death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through that one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, ooh, what's the therefore there? As one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All right, so first up, we're going to talk about the sin that came through the one man, and that one man was Adam. All right, and what do we call that sin? That is the original sin. All right, where did it originate? The Garden of Eden is where it all took place. How is it then passed on to us? We die. Mm hmm. No. How is it passed on to us? That's the end result. Yes. From our parents. From our parents. Yeah. Have you ever written a thank you note to your parents for original sin? Probably not. Thank you for passing on this sin to me. Now because of you I'm mortal. All right? As you were conceived and born into sin, as the book of Psalms says, so you now receive the due penalty for being a sinner. Now, every sin thereafter is actually called an actual sin, all right? Uh -huh. There's original sin and actual sin. Original is what's passed on to you from your parents. The actual sin is actually what you commit from day in and day, a day in and day out basis. Yep, Barry. I always use this same uh, analogy uh, when someone asks, well, what happens to the people who don't hear about Jesus and they die? Yep. And it comes back to the original sin. Actually, I'm going to give you my study sheet from last week because it gets to that very point. Because it says there is no excuse. There is no excuse because of the fact that, that what, what are we pointing to? Does anybody remember from last week? Yeah, say it. Creation. Creation all around us then directs us to the Almighty. Yes. So now, if we have original sin and we commit actual sins, all right, we've got the cute little baby, and everybody always says the cute little baby is perfect. I got news for you. They aren't, all right? They aren't. I've had the cute and cuddly ones, all right? They're, they're my own. They're wonderful. They are conceived and born into sin. And because they're conceived and born into sin, what do they need right away? My way. No, well, yes, that's true. <laughs> Barry, that's not what I was going for. <laughs> they need a bath. They're dirty. All right? It works out really well that when they come out of the womb, they really are dirty. Okay? They're really dirty and messy. It's kind of like this great visual reminder of, yeah, this needs a scrub-a-dub-dub -dub in the tub. All right? Uh, and that scrub-a-dub experience is all given in baptism. So the question you know, that always comes up here, too, is, is infant baptism versus waiting for baptism and then choosing baptism later in life, all right, in terms of the Baptist theology that comes about. The reason that Lutherans hold true is because Christ clearly says, baptize all nations. When you're doing a census, just as an example, do you count all the people or just simply the heads of the household? 
you count all the people, baptize all nations. And what's more is, in the Psalms, as I pointed out, it does say we are conceived and born into sin. The question then is not, what can I do for God? That's Baptist theology there that says, I choose Jesus. Instead, the point is, it's what God can do for me. Who does the saving act in baptism? Is it God or is it the person? It better be God. Because the last time I tried to save myself, it did not go well. All right? It was like Peter there drowning and everything. And he's reaching out saying, please save me, Jesus. And Jesus is like, oh, I don't think I'm going to do it. And stuff. No. Jesus reaches down and he pulls us up. And he is the one who does the saving work. All right? So baptism, absolute necessity. What is God's remedy for sin? All right, we're going to reread verses 18 and 19 here for a second. And then we're going to look at a longer passage. So get ready, hold on tight, because we have a long passage there. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. One man's disobedience, everybody's a sinner. One act of righteousness, all men righteous. How does it happen? Hebrews 10. If you ever want just a really, really good, good read of a book, you read the book of Hebrews. And then before you do that, the book of Hebrews should really start out with the word therefore. You want to know why? Because you should really read the book of Leviticus before you read the book of Hebrews. Okay? All right? So that's your assignment here. It's due tomorrow. Okay? Leviticus. What's the book for No! No, 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 no. Barry! Strike that from the record. Take that out of the camera there and everything. So, oh, yeah. For since the law has but a shadow of good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. So, I mean, there's blood everywhere, remember? There's sacrifices being made constantly. None of them does any good to make universal atonement. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. So think about that. They're doing the sacrifices. It reminds them, oh my goodness, we are sinners. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Who are they talking about? Jesus. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified, made holy, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. I love that imagery. His enemies made a footstool for his feet. I want you, next time you see a footstool, think of Satan, and I want you to kick the footstool. All right? Yeah. That's, that's my imagery here. So That's not in the commentary in the bottom here. can't imagine why. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for that for saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. So, once for all sacrifice is whom? Jesus. 
all sacrifices leading up, tabernacle, temple, temple one, temple two, all the sacrifices being made, all do what? Do they actually make the satisfaction for everyone's sins? No, but as the people see the shed blood of those animals, what are their minds then directed to? Jesus, specifically, back to a promise that was made all the way back in the book of Genesis chapter 3, when, in fact, the promise of Christ was made because it said, from the offspring of Eve would come the one who would then, in fact, save the whole world. And then it points them forward then to Jesus to look forward to the one who would shed his blood on Calvary. We confess this in the second article of the creed, not by gold or silver, but by his holy and precious blood. Holy and precious blood. And all of our sins are washed away. We are in overtime. All right. Romans 6 is on your own. All right. I really encourage you to go through this. I also encourage you, next week is also Invite a Friend Week, just like this week was and every week thereafter. All right? So we have 90 people. You're just going to hear me say it over and over again. But the thing is here, go through Romans 6. It is some of the most beautiful scripture. That's really kind of hard to say. But it is absolutely beautiful scripture. It directs us solely to our baptism, which is where our hope comes from where Jesus joined himself to us, where we died with Christ, where we were raised with Christ. And while you're at it, go and check out your catechism. Look at those four parts of baptism, especially part four, which will connect you directly to this text. We close with prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, may it take root in us. Lord, accomplish your will among us. Lord, be with us as we go our separate ways, as we continue in the divine service yet today. Lord, may your will be done in our congregation. Grant us unity in Christ, unity in your word. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be and abide with us now and always. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, thanks everybody.